We are going to be talking about flipping flatware. So I'm talking specifically about stainless flatware, finding stainless flatware at the thrift stores, yard sales, estate sales, and then turning around and selling them on eBay, Etsy, Poshmark, Mercari um, for a profit. So over the years of reselling, I've now been reselling probably 15, 16 years, and I have done and sold a lot of flatware and made thousands of dollars on this kind of overlooked, possibly um, little category. So I, do, I don't have, I have all the links to my stores below and if you look through them, you won't see a lot of flatware currently. And this is something that I wanted to talk about right away. Um, before you dive into your, um, before you dive into this, category, I want you to stop and think about your thrift stores and think about what you've seen at those thrift stores. So do you see a big tub of flatware that you're able to dig through? Does your, th does your thrift store put them in baggies and hang them on the wall? Um, thrift stores all handle it differently. And I've definitely lived in parts of the country where I could not find flatware very easily at thrift stores or yard sales. And so my flatware sales slowed down quite a bit. And then I lived in other parts of the country where flatware was in every thrift store and I could build up inventory very, very easily. So um, keep that in mind. It might, this is a category that might not work for you and for where you're at. Although I will say that I have, once I had some experience with it, um, there was a time where I did buy a few stainless flatware lots on auction sites or even on eBay itself and then turned around and split them up and made a profit that way. Um, so the area I'm currently in, there's a, there's some flatware. I just, I don't pick it up. It's not like I pick it up on every thrifting trip, which I probably could have in Washington, the last place I lived. Um, so it's not on my radar as much anymore. Um, I think when you're not coming across it very often, you're not as excited to list it. And I do have a backlog <laughs> of flatware to get listed. And so it's just kind of been in my garage. It's out of sight, out of mind. I'm not like thinking about flatware cause I'm not seeing it every day. I'm not seeing it at the thrift stores and things like that, but it was really profitable when I did it. And so what I'd like to do is to turn that profit pile into profit again. And that's what made me think of this month. Um, I'm It's like flipping flatware January. I know February would have sounded better flipping flatware February, but I didn't want to wait that long. So I wanted to go ahead and get started on that. So this is kind of an accountability for me as well. So I can, as I'm going along, as I'm listing, and I'll make some videos to share some of the information that I've accumulated about selling flatware, and it gets me working on getting flatware back into my stores. So I do sell my newer flatware on eBay, and for the most part, I sell, I've sold quite a bit of vintage flatware on Etsy, and it seems to sell pretty well. So what I did is I know I've talked about how I like to sell my vintage on Ruby Lane now. So what I did is I took my old Etsy shop that used to be my general vintage shop and I turned it into Pish Posh Flatware. So I'm going to work on just filling that store with flatware. And I have a lot of vintage flatware that I've accumulated along the way. And um, so I think a lot of my focus this month will be on the vintage brands. Um, but as I come across things that I just haven't gotten to list yet, I'll see if it needs to maybe have a better audience on eBay, especially if it's a newer, a newer um, pattern, it might not qualify for Etsy's 20 year rule anyway. So we'll see. Um, I kind of just go pattern and by pattern to see whether it should go eBay, Etsy, or whatever. There's certain styles of flatware, of vintage flatware that do really, really well on Etsy, mid-century, atomic, that type of thing. So this is my accountability post. Hold on, I will try not to throw my back out. 
But what I decided is I've got this bin. You can see it's bigger than the shoebox kind. But uh, this is some of the flatware, just a drop in the bucket of what I have. Like I said, I was buying lots at certain times. <laughs> So I have, oh, that's great vintage flatware. I just need to get it on Etsy, you know. So I have to, I did during the pandemic at one point kind of cull some things, got rid of some older listings on eBay. Um, but there's still, there's just so much more I can work on. So my goal is to have this, a bin like this done every week. And I can share with you as I make these videos different things different pieces maybe that have sold or just see if my flatware sales pick up and I can share that information with you. So today we're going to start with talking about the brands to pick up and um, you know flatware is not always the fastest selling category. You almost you know it's kind of like you're you're selling replacement parts or pieces to someone and you just have to wait until they need it. Now sometimes you might find a whole set and you're able to just go ahead and, you know, list the whole set and someone snaps that up pretty quickly if it's a popular brand um, or an attractive, you know, people who just come across it and they, they think it looks nice. So what we're going to talk about today is the brands that are probably fairly easy to find and are worth picking up the flatware that you find in those brands. And I think I'll start from the top, I'm gonna do the top 10 of my 10 favorite brands or consistent selling brands that I've come across. And we'll start with my least favorite, the ones I'm just not super excited about, down to my most favorite, probably most profitable brand of stainless flatware that I would even suggest is the one you should just start with because that's, probably the easiest to find and the easiest to sell. So we'll go ahead and go, th go through those. We're also going to go through, um, I'll make some more videos throughout the month as I'm focused on my flatware this month. And we'll make some videos about um, how to list them. You know, how do you, do you divide up things or how do you store your flatware? How do you ship your flatware? We can cover all of that. And then one of the most um, common questions I got, because I, I used to have a blog and I wrote about selling flatware on my blog. It was called The Recyclista. And I would get comments all the time. How do you identify this stainless flatware pattern, right? So I had written an article about that and that was one of my most Googled articles that would come up is... And a lot of times, I don't think it was necessarily resellers. It was just people who had a pattern and they wanted more and they wanted to know how to find out the name of their pattern. And so there's some tips and tricks I have for that. So we will definitely be talking about that as well. So if that's something, if flatware is something that you want to hear more about, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Go ahead and hit the post notification bell just so that it'll let you know when the videos go up. And otherwise, I think we should just go ahead and start with number 10 on the title page. So we're calling this our top 10 stainless flatware brands to sell on eBay. And you see the little note there that, yeah, it's really hard to narrow it down just to 10. <laughs> so I share more than 10 in here. Um, and some of them are just kind of grouped together in under a certain category. And so that's how I get away with using the top 10. But there's just so much information. There's so much I could share. And I was trying to control myself and just focus on the stuff that's probably the easiest to find. So let's start with number 10. Okay, the International Silver Company. So I have I said I was starting with kind of my least favorite. And I will admit when I see International on the back of pieces of flatware, I don't get super excited. Um, it depends on the pieces. It depends on the pattern and how it looks. But um, most of the categories that we're going to talk about today or most of the brands, there's they're kind of like umbrella companies. And so there's various back stamps. The, the writing on the back of the flatware will vary depending on 
it's kind of like different branches of that silverware company. So now International, they do a lot of sterling and they do a lot of silver plate. And they were probably established more like in their history was more focused on silver plate. And then as stainless got more popular, then they added stainless to their to their roster. But it does tend to sell maybe a little bit slower. So there are a few different um, back stamps you can look for. You'll recognize as international. Some will just say international stainless deluxe. 1847 Rogers Brothers is another common back stamp that was also used on some silver plate. And then Lion or Leon um, is a mark that's on the back also that might not you might not recognize right away that it's international, but you just put you put that lion or leon on the on your listing and people will find it. So, and then there's Rogers, Rogers cutlery. So a lot of times when they're using some of these other back stamps, international silver, oftentimes puts their initials IS also on the back, on the back stamp. So that can help. So. Um, yeah, 1847 can be fairly good. Um, you'll see the Rogers name can get very, very confusing. Um, lots of different flatware brands, we're going to see later Oneida and some other ones, have some kind of Rogers type back stamps in their, in their collection of flatware. And so... It can get kind of confusing, um, but you just kind of have to research each one. But sometimes that initials, the IS initials can help. So going on to nine, we have Gorham. Maybe you've heard of that. They also do some um, hollowware, which is, again, that's another company that does silver plate and does um, sterling. And Gorham silver plate comes up quite quite often as well as sterling. But if we're focused on the stainless, there are a few different back stamps with that that you need to know. So there's one that's called the G back stamp, but it also says Gorham, so that's easy. It's just the mark on the back has a G. Then there's Steger, and then the G-O-R in Steger stands for Gorham. I don't remember what the S-T-E stands for. And then there's Steger Craft. There's Americraft. And then there's Design Studios. So some are more common than others. I've definitely had the G back stamp and the Steger, Steger Craft. Possibly a little bit of Americraft, but I don't think I've ever picked up any Design Studios. And Design Studios might also possibly say Gorham on it. I think I saw a couple examples that say that as well. But it's a fairly solid brand. Um, Stegor and Steger Craft, definitely mid-century. Um, one of the one of a one good find I had with Gorham was a set of flatware called um, the pattern was called Pace. And it was very mid-century looking. I got it at an estate sale. And I sold it on Etsy. I sold it broken up into different smaller lots. And I made sure to mention that what the back stamp says. So they made the same pattern, Pace. Some pieces have the G Gorham back stamp and some have the Steger back stamp. To me, they kind of look the same. I think I came across um, some with the G back stamp at one point. And I couldn't really tell a difference, but I think if you had them like both in your hand, so say a person has a set of paste flatware and they need some more pieces, there's say Steger on the back, possibly made at a different time than the other ones. And um, they want to make sure that their pieces also say Steger on the back because the, 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 sometimes the weight, the quality will match up better that time. Some people don't care. They just want something close, so it won't really matter, but just make sure to go ahead and put that, whatever the back stamp is, make sure you put that in your listing. And that's true of all flatware. Just put the back stamp, put the location where it was made, and um, if, you know, if it says China or Vietnam or 
Japan or whatever, the location is important and that's not the last time I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> okay, so the next one is one of these ones where I kind of cheated and I kind of call them in my head, they're kind of broken into department store brands. So I think of like Mikasa or Lennox or Henkel's, J.A. Henkel's. Um, you know, you can think of other brands, maybe like Norataki or Denby or Falzgraf. So in my head, they're department store brands like you would get at Macy's, but also maybe patterns that match dinnerware, right? So a lot of times you're researching flatware and you have to research the dinnerware. That that happens a lot with, I think it was Falzgraf, Um the flatware is, is not kind of a standalone thing. It's part of their dinnerware set. So it, the handles maybe are plastic with a design that matches their dishes, right? So I kind of lump those all together as far as equal, um, I don't know, equal desirability or ability to sell. I've sold a, probably mostly I have Little Stars next to Lennox because I've probably sold that the most. Henkel's is pretty solid. It's very bread and butter. And yeah, you might know Henkel's from the knives that they make. Um, but there is some flatware patterns that they make as well. Mikasa can do okay, but there's pieces I've had that sell super fast and for good money and some that have just sat. So I think I've kind of focused on the pieces that say like Made in Japan they're a little bit vintage. Studio Nova is a different line, you know, it's a, a different line of Mikasa. And some of those pieces are sought after as well. So first FAQ of the, of the video today is how should I list my flatware? So this is a question that's come up to me fairly often. And I'll just explain what I mean by this. How should I list my flatware? What I mean is a lot of people, sometimes you get a big lot or a big set of a bunch of flatware in the same pattern. And you don't know whether to list it all together or divide it up or how to divide it up. And so that's what's behind this question. How should I list my flatware? So how do you want to list your flatware? Well, there are a few different options. Now, say you've got a bunch of pieces of flatware from the same pattern and or even a full set. And you may be wondering, how do I div divide this up or should I just sell it all together? A lot of that is really up to you. So I kind of take it case by case. Um, now, if I have a large lot and it's it's not a complete set or there's a lot of uneven pieces, like you could have a service for four, which would be 20 pieces, which would be like four dinner forks, four salad forks, four teaspoons, four oval soup spoons, and four dinner knives. If I found a service for four like that, I might be tempted to just keep it all together and just list it as a ready-made set ready to go. Now, if I found like, I don't know, 29 pieces of the same pattern and there's only like three dinner forks, but then there's six salad forks, I would probably be tempted to take option number two, which is to just make different listings. Like in that case, maybe five different listings. And I would put all the dinner forks in one and all the salad forks in another, and then all the soup spoons and another, all the teaspoons in one and, and so on and so forth. Serving pieces, if you find those can be individually or grouped together. Um, so it just depends also on the value of the pattern. I could, um, another option, so there's three options. You can just, if you don't want to really dive deep into flatware and you just come across a lot of good pieces or a lot of pieces from the same pattern, and you're like, you know what, I'm just gonna list it, make a profit, move on. That's totally doable, that's totally valid. Um, you could do several small groupings. 
like I just described, and that actually would make you a little bit more profit generally because the more you group together, this is true of most, most things, the more you group together, the less you can get for each individual piece. So if you kind of make those groups a little smaller, you can charge a little bit more for each individual piece. Um, and so then that leads to the last option, which is individually, every single piece separately. And most people do that. If you look on eBay right now and the flatware sellers who are serious flatware sellers, they do lots of what are called variation listings. So it's one listing, but within the eBay listing, people can pick and choose which pieces and how many of each piece that they want. And you can set different prices for each of those. That I think actually does technically make you the most profit if you do it like that. They're a little tedious to set up, but they're not too bad. And that's what I did on that set of Reed and Barton that I talked about in my top 22 finds for 2022. Even though it was a full set, I probably, I think I mentioned in that video, I could have asked maybe two or three hundred dollars for the set. But because I did it individually and some of the pieces were $20 for one fork or $25 for a spoon or $30, the prices were really good on that flatware. So I made more money by selling them individually and then people could pick and choose what they wanted. They picked two forks and one teaspoon and, and it works really well for people like that. Another benefit to a variation listing is that if it's a pattern that you feel like you'll come across often, so like flatware sellers who are like really selling flatware and are acquiring it however they do, they could just keep adding to that variation listing. And eBay really likes those listings. They, whenever I would sell some pieces from it, then I seem to have kind of a a flurry of more sales from that listing. Um, so kind of the more sales you get from that, eBay was like, oh, that's a really good listing and they keep promoting it. Um, so that's just different options. I generally, I tend to do the middle option the most. Um, I do smaller groupings. It's kind of a, I don't know, it's kind of a, a middle ground, right? Things might move a little bit faster um, like right now, I think I just ended that variation listing because all I had left in it was butter spreaders and I can just make a separate listing for the butter spreaders by themselves or either a quantity or I could just make a listing that someone could buy all eight or six or whatever it is I have right now. So yeah, so it's up to you, I, you know, and it really depends on your goals too for your flatware listings. You can just test the waters. Um, sometimes I kind of go, I generally, I like to do groups of four, so four dinner fork, forks, four teaspoons. That's a nice even number that works pretty well. Um, if something's a little bit more pricey, instead of going individual, I might do two dinner forks or two teaspoons. Um, especially if they're really expensive, people tend not to buy a bunch at once. They just want to buy you know, a little bit at a time, you know, as they can afford it. So what I might do too for lotting up flatware, say I get a vintage pattern, there's not a high demand, there's not, it's not a high value. I'm, my like lowest price usually is about $2 per piece, like $2 per fork and spoon and everything. So I don't want to list, make too many listings that are just like $8. Um, so what I might do is just gather up. I did a listing like that today where I just had like eight pieces in that pattern. So I just made a lot of those eight pieces and I do $15 or $16 or $18 or whatever. It just makes it a little bit more worth my time. And if a pattern is not too sought after, then the people who are looking for it are probably looking for whatever they can find of it. So they're more likely to just buy all of it anyway. And so that works out for both of us, right? So anyway, I hope that helps. I hope it didn't just confuse things even more. But 
like I said, there's three options. You can lot it all up and just move it on and get it gone. You can do smaller groupings or you can go ahead and do one at a time. And I would recommend the variation listing. Uh, Etsy has one as well. And I think eBay especially prefers that over you just filling up your eBay store with one fork and then one fork and one fork and one fork. You know what I mean? Especially since the listings would be very similar. eBay doesn't like that very much. So that answers our first FAQ. Yamazaki. Yamazaki, I have had really good experiences with it and then some so-so experiences with it. So I would say it's hit or miss, but I would most likely pick up Yamazaki flatware if I found it and just take a chance. When you're only paying 25 cents or 20 cents or 10 cents per piece of flatware, it's a brand that I definitely go ahead and take my chances on and, um, and just see how it happens. You know, some things you'll list and you'll get sold right away and then others it might sit, but maybe a year later somebody buys it. So that's just kind of, you know, I was very much a flatware seller. So to me, it didn't really matter the amount of time it took for pieces to list or to sell. Now, there is a pattern in Yamazaki that I think is super fun. And it's one of the most popular um, patterns that they have. It's called Gone Fishing. And I'll try to pop up a photo right here. But it's basically flatware in the shape of a fish <laughs> on the handle. Um, Yamazaki flatware is also known, a lot of their patterns have a gold version or a gold accent version. Um, there might be one that's all silver and then another one, it's like the same pattern, but with a gold accent to it, like a, a trim around the edges or whatever like that. Um, but you, the gold can wear off pretty easily. So Unless the gold is like in really, really good condition, I will just leave it behind, you know. So um, if it's in really good condition, I grab it for sure because a lot of those are actually very sought after. Let us go on to our next number six. Now, Reed and Barton. Reed and Barton could actually be closer to the bottom of the list because I have sold over the years quite a bit of Reed and Barton. So when I see Reed and Barton, if it looks pretty good, I will usually pick it up. And there are a few different back stamps. There's Reba Craft is part of Reed and Barton. And those are generally on the vintage pieces. They're very vintage, old fashioned kind of looking. And then there's Reed and Barton Select. There's some other, um, another little offshoot or specialty is called like heritage heritage mint and those pieces actually sell really well but they say reed and barton stainless heritage mint like all on the back of it so reed and barton i think if you saw my video um of the top my top 22 sales of 2022 i did talk about my good Reed and Barton score <laughs> that I got at the thrift store and how I had paid 20, 20, 25 dollars for a full set of flatware at the thrift store. And then I divided it up and sold it and so far have made about $850 or so in profit on that. So Definitely was a good pattern. Now the thing is, so this this is where this tip comes in, and this is not just true of just Reed and Barton, but lots of uh, flatware companies. So sometimes they remake a pattern or reissue it, so there can be older and newer versions of the same pattern. So that was true of the the pieces that I had, and they were the older. They were from 1961, and the older ones were more sought after and the prices were a lot higher, which is why I sold. Well, that's why I made so much money on that set. If it was the newer, like 2004 version, it just wouldn't have sold for as much. So you kind of have to research that. Now I'll get into it more in other videos about researching and things, but re uh, replacements.com is a wealth of information 
once you have your pattern and you need to look up different things, a lot of times there's dates on their, their listings and, um, there's lengths usually. So sometimes you can only figure out the age of a pattern. Like say you have a fork and you're not sure if it's the older or the newer, like if the back stamps can't tell you, then you compare to replacements.com and the older version of the flatware, maybe the fork was seven and a quarter inches and the newer version, it's only seven inches. So then you measure your forks and you find out which version that you have. That's just one example of how you can research that. So values will definitely vary. So that's just a general flatware tip um, that was demonstrated by my Reed and Barton flatware score. Okay. Alrighty, let us go on to number five. This is Toll, Toll Silversmiths, and they have quite a few different back stamps, as you can see here. There is an SCC, which has to do with the Supreme Cutlery Company. Um, they have, and that's generally vintage flatware. There's F.B. Rogers, which that's one of, another one of those examples of a variation of Rogers names <laughs> that can get confusing. Then there's Georgian House. Um, so I don't know that I've found F.B. Rogers before or even Georgian House. Definitely have sold a lot of pieces that say Toll, that say Supreme Cutlery, that say SCC. And then my favorite, probably one of my top favorite, favorite ever flatware company brands, whatever, is Laufer. So Laufer is part of Toll, but it doesn't say Toll anywhere on it. It just says Laufer. It's very mid-century. It's very modern looking, modernist. I just love finding it. I have found a few pieces, you know, over the years. It's not impossible to find. It's just when you find it, you have found a good thing. It will definitely sell. So that's just something to keep in mind. Sometimes you forget the, the <coughs> excuse me, the connection between Laufer and Toll. But it wouldn't really matter. You can just list it as Laufer and that's what people are looking for. Okay, in a similar idea, I kind of lump these together too. Um, and I just give a few examples. So I call these like Scandinavian brands. So basically, if you find some flatware, it's most likely going to look fairly modernist or modern or mid-century. And if it says made in Sweden, made in Denmark, Norway or Finland, just go ahead and grab it and buy it. I'm sure it's a good thing to sell. There's sometimes you come across little serving pieces. There's like Salandia, um, brands like that, you know, basically anything Scandinavian, not even in the flatware <laughs> connection is usually worth buying and flipping. So Dansk is a very good, um, brand to know, not just for flatware, but for home goods for vintage home goods or even current. And then Gens is another good one, I think often made in Sweden on that one. So sometimes the production of the flatware was moved to Japan. So you'll see pieces that are marked Japan. But if they're marked Denmark or Finland or Norway, they're going to be worth more money. So again, this is very, that's important. Again, I've, I think I said it once already, and it comes up with a few other brands as well. Um, just make sure you put the location in your listing and then make sure you're researching the right version of your flatware. So don't compare the Finland pieces with the Japan pieces and the prices. You gotta, you gotta look at it differently. And that's where replacements.com will help you find the version that says Denmark or Finland, and then look at those prices. So yeah, a bonus if it's modernist or MCM looking, mid-century modern. Um, I had my best score was a Dansk set of flatware called Odin. 
and I'll pop up a picture right here. Um, I'll also pop up how much it sold for because I don't remember off the top of my head and I forgot to write it down. I believe it was over $200 and I just went ahead and listed the whole thing together. Um, and I believe I just came across that at a, at a thrift store. I think just on the baggy wall kind of thing. But that's fun. Of course, I love anything vintage and mid-century modern. And so these tend to be some of my favorite, favorite things to find. Favorite flatware brands to find. Okay, we're up to another FAQ. So the question on this one is, what should I include in my listing? Okay, and now we're back with our second AFQ, what to include in the listing. Okay, so I kind of have a formula that I go by, especially with my title. So I start my title with the brand and then the name of the pattern. And then I say what the piece is, like dinner forks, dinner spoon, or dinner knives, teaspoons, soup spoons, whatever it is. I do the name of the piece, then I do how many pieces, like the number of pieces in it. Then I might add, depending on what's left, some of, you know, pattern names can be really long. But if I still have space, I might use the word stainless to make it clear that it's not a silver plate. Because a lot of brands um, have patterns that come in both, stainless and silver plate, and look the same. And so I would add the word stainless. I might use the word replacement. And if there's room, I might feel like if there's any kind of description words that I can use, like floral or burnished or black accent or scroll or plume or, you know, anything like that that I can use to describe it, then I do that because um, that really helps people who haven't found the name of their pattern and maybe they're just going to throw some keywords in. So using the word replacement is just kind of filler, you know, if there isn't, um, you know, if you have no other words to put in the title, it just kind of gives people that idea that these are pre-owned pieces. So in the listing, I am definitely sure to put the exact wording of the back stamp. And we mentioned, I don't know if we mentioned it, depending on where this video pops up in the overall video. <laughs> um, I, if it includes, well, okay. So I know I've mentioned location. So if the back stamp mentions location, for sure, we've talked about that too many times already. So like where it was made, Germany or, or Japan or whatever. If the, you know, people are also trying to match up the back stamp to the pieces that they already have. So not just location, but like there's an example with Oneida, there's Oneida, and then there's Oneida USA. USA is the older stuff. And so people might want the older stuff that matches their mom's pattern. And then the, you know, the newer stuff might not be the same quality that they're looking for. I try to put the decade or the year if I know it. Sometimes um, that site, replacements.com, gives an idea. Some, some patterns were in production for a really long time. And so, you know, you might not be able to put a decade or you could just put like when it started. Um, then what I do is I list the pieces that I'm including. So if it's a mixed lot, I might say, you know, you know four dinner forks, three salad forks, two teaspoons. And then after each one, I give the length of each piece. So like dinner fork, seven and a quarter inches, dinner knife, you know, nine inches, things like that. So um, the length can be important, especially with spoons and teaspoons, because the pictures are going to look like dinner spoons or place spoons, they call them. They have lots of different names oval soup spoons. Anyway, the big, the big spoon that you're, you know, used to using. Basically, it, it looks very similar to a teaspoon in the pictures. And so people look at it and they're like, you know, 
what like how long is it because they're trying to get one they're trying to get teaspoons or they're trying to get soup spoons so if you have the measurements right there they can be sure that yes you know what you're talking about and that these are tablespoons not teaspoons or or whatever so anyway so I put length it's kind of important important like you know a lot of things measurements are important important wow it's late at night I can't talk okay so then as far as condition, now there are times where there's definitely issues that need to be mentioned. There could be pitting, there could be hopefully not, I don't list anything that has disposal damage, but you know, you might come across that. You could even say it doesn't have disposal damage. Um, you know, there could be scratches in the bowl of like spoons like people's teeth like left a lot of scratches so anyway you there might be definite things that you need to mention but if if I'm looking at some flatware if it doesn't look absolutely new what I end up saying is and this is a little blurb I just kind of put in my flatware listings I sell similar off of it so I don't have to keep typing it over and over again and I just say signs of use consistent with pre-owned flatware, such as from stacking or washing. So sometimes there's like hard water stains or whatever that aren't, that's not a deal breaker. They would fit in well with your everyday set. Okay, so it's kind of like saying these don't look brand new, but the set you've been using probably look like these do. And you could just add them to your set and they'll fit right in. Okay, so that's kind of my way of like, if something doesn't have a very specific error or damage, then it's just my way of saying, hey, they're used, okay? So um, then I go ahead, you know, I'll add specifics, like say, I might say all that, and then I might say one teaspoon has a small area of pitting on the back, you know, and that's mostly flat, uh, vintage flatware will have issues like that that people are willing to overlook because it's really hard to find those patterns. So that's what I include in my listings plus photos. I should mention photos. I take a picture of all of the pieces. I take a picture for Etsy, what I started doing for my first photo. I'll try to pop an example up here. I just take one of the pieces up higher than the rest of the pieces and I get a picture of the pattern at the end of the handle but then the pieces that are included below like are kind of blurry behind it that's usually my first photo so they can see the pattern right away and then all the all the pieces and then I go up close again on the handles so they can see the pattern really well I get an up close of like the bowls of the forks and spoons or the blades of the knives I flip everything over take an overall picture of the backs and then I make sure I get a really clear picture of the back stamp in case they don't read they can see it in the photos and make sure it looks exactly the same as theirs because there is okay I'm not trying to overwhelm you with details but some flatware the way the back stamp is on the back can help you decide whether it's vintage or not whatever anyway um and then I make sure to get kind of an up close picture of the condition of the back of the bowls of the spoons and forks and you know, things like that. And I think that's pretty much it for photos. So like five, six, I mean, you can take as many as you want. If I'm doing a big lot, you know, I'll take a picture of everything. And then I might take a picture of just the dinner spoon, dinner forks and just the dinner knives and just, and so on and so on. So anyway, but make sure you do the tops and the backs, clear pictures of the back stamp, and you are good to go. Okay, so that's what I include in my flatware listing. Feel free, like I said, I'm adding more and more flatware listings. So if you want to look down in the description, I have my store, Pish Posh Flatware, and I'm slowly <laughs> adding things to it. And um, you can just kind of get an idea of what my listings look like if that helps. Okay, let's move on to the next number. The brand that I love to find and sell, number three, is WMF Cromargan. 
And look what I say there, location is going to be important. <laughs> so yeah, same thing. I'll, you know, most of it's made in Germany, but there's some pieces that were also Japan. So just make note of it. Now there was a big misconception, misunderstanding um, about the letters W, M, F. And a lot, you'll see in a lot of listings, William Fraser. Now there was a man whose last name was Fraser, Fraser. But he had, his name wasn't even William, and he had something to do with a, a store that sold home goods, like in California in the 40s, and WMF actually bought him out, but then they became a distributor, so they call, it got called like Fraser's WMF, and then later the name changed completely again. But there was no William Fraser, but you'll see on tons of listings for WMF, you'll see Frasers or William Fraser. And it's just, um, there was a popular stainless flatware guide that was written quite a few years ago, and they have that mistake in there. And so it just kind of perpetuated that idea on and on. So it doesn't stand for William Fraser. It's actually German words that I am not even going to try to pronounce. Let's see, what did I do with it? Okay, but it basically, if you translated it into English, the initials match up too, but it's the Wurttemberg Metalware Factory is what it would translate to. And then Cro-Margan is just WMF's trademark name for stainless steel. And again, it's kind of like the Scandinavian pieces. They're very modern looking, mid-century looking, and everybody wants it. Everybody loves it. It sells super fast. Number two, another one of my cheat ones. I just love selling vintage flatware. And so I couldn't really just pick one of these brands to say, you know, you should find or sell. Um, there's basically you know here's a list of some of the brands you'll probably come across a lot of these were just you know grandma had them and um you know echo eterna there's a very popular pattern in echo called canoe muffin and it's very popular with the mid-century people the danish modern looking type flatware Interpure, there's a few patterns that just sell as soon as I list them. Marcrest has a very famous, um, not famous, has a very popular atomic starburst looking pattern. And so you could throw in there any, any pattern that has atomic starburst on it will sell. Then there's National, there's Oxford Hall, Stanley Roberts, and then even flatware that doesn't even have a brand and you probably will never find the brand it's just says stainless japan on the back and it was interesting when i had my etsy shop when i had a lot of flatware listed i looked at some of my stats one day and my top search term that brought people to my etsy shop was stainless japan so I just think it was a very, you know, maybe it wasn't very expensive when it first came out, but people still have it. Their grandma had it. You know, that's one of the reasons it's so, such a good niche to sell flatware because people want to replace grandma's flatware or they've, it's been handed down and they just, they want to add to it or it's just memories. They want, um, they remember grandma's flatware. I've sold a lot of, there's a one uh, pattern in Oneida called Twin Star. So speaking of atomic flatware, it's probably the easiest flatware ever to sell. And it's called Twin Star, like I said, and people all of a sudden see a picture of it and they're like, oh my goodness, my grandma had that flatware or my mom or whoever, you know, and it's just this instant, I get messages all the time you know, of their memories of the flatware. So Stainless Japan, even though it doesn't have a brand, you know, you can still list it, you can describe it. Um, there's a set of stainless flatware that just says stainless 
Japan. There's different styles of it, but it has like black handles in like a composite type material. And there's different variations of the handles, but you know, very modern looking, mid-century looking. And they were a grocery store giveaways. So every week you could get a few more pieces, a few more pieces, depending on how much you spend. So lots of people are like, my grandma collected this flatware for weeks or my mom did and I'm trying to add to my set, you know. So it's really cool. That's just the fun part of vintage, right? And so anyway, now that's why it's in number two. I like selling it. It sells well because of those reasons I gave. Memories and nostalgia and things like that. So... All right, let's go on to number one. You probably have guessed it by now because I haven't mentioned it, and you might even have this flatware on your table right at the moment, but it is number one, Oneida. Okay, one of the biggest companies, and there are so many different branches to Oneida, so there's all different back stamps. You're going to have Oneida Community, Oneida, it might just say Oneida USA, Deluxe, Northland, Rogers. Now Oneida has a bunch. There's 1881 Rogers and William A. Rogers and Simeon and George Rogers and goes on and on. There's a well-selling line of Oneida. It's like their top stainless flatware. It's called Heirloom and it doesn't say Heirloom but it has a back stamp that looks like a little cube. Anyway, so all sorts of potential so there's always seems to be Oneida flatware out and about. Um, community sells really well. Uh, Oneida USA. Now, that's one of those ones, keep in mind, some of those patterns are still being made. You can buy them on Amazon. But if you find pieces at the thrift store that are pre-owned and they say Oneida USA, it means they're the original vintage, most likely older pieces. And that's what people want to know. They want to know it says Oneida USA on the back because it's different. The quality is better. There's Deluxe, Distinction Deluxe. I should have thrown that in there. Um, yeah, all sorts of different back stamps. And I just, like I said at the beginning, I would just, I would start with Oneida because it's probably the easiest to find and it's definitely like, especially Community, Distinction Deluxe, Oneida, USA. People are just going to want to find it and need to replace things. Now, some of these are older. They're like mid-century patterns. Some are newer. People, you know, registered for their weddings and got Oneida flatware in the 90s and the 2000, early 2000s and need replacement pieces because just think about what happens to your flatware, right? Teaspoons get get down the disposal or kids are scraping their plates and they scrape their food, their, you know, forks and spoons right into the garbage can. Um, all sorts of different things, why people need replacements. So, or they just want to grow. Maybe they had a smaller set and now their family's gotten bigger and they want to expand their set. So Oneida definitely have made lots of money on Oneida. There was also, speaking of nostalgia, there was a program back with Betty Crocker. And you could save up Betty Crocker coupons. And you could then um, exchange them for flatware. So I've gotten lots of messages from people whose moms, like saved up a whole set for themselves and then they went ahead and saved up a whole set for their daughter for like their hope chest kind of thing. Um, so lots and lots of memories associated with the Betty Crocker, um, you know, coupon program. Maybe we'll make a video about that. And I think we're going to do another video just about Oneida because there's so much more we could talk about. So anyway, that was number one. Let's see what we can talk about next. One last FAQ. How do I identify my flatware pattern? I'm sure you're all dying to know. Okay, so to answer that question on 
how do I identify my stainless flatware pattern? You're just going to have to wait till next week because <laughs> it needs its own video, right? We don't want to take the, you know, this has just a, been a brief beginning overview that I hope taught you a few things about selling stainless flatware to see if it's something that you'd even be interested in. Just some information to get you started, hopefully. So go ahead, hit the subscribe button, and we will have more flatware information coming up this month. And the first video I'll do after this one, um, I'm not going to promise a day because I always say that. And then like this week, I wanted to get this out on Thursday and it just was not possible. Um, so anyway, it's coming out on Friday if I can stay up and edit tonight as long as needed. Anyway, so just in a quick review, I like I think I mentioned you want to start dabbling I would keep my eyes open for some Oneida flatware some community Oneida USA things like that um you know selling flatware it doesn't have to be your main thing it can just be kind of a sideline kind of keep some knowledge in the back of your head if you come across something at an estate sale or a thrift store has you know a big case of something in their you know maybe up in their case or something you'll know whether it's worth it um, but anyway, flatware sells year round. There are times of the year where it might sell a little bit more, such as around the holidays, as people are increasing their guests. And maybe afterwards, as people realize what they lost after their guests came. <laughs> um, and yeah, or just replacement at that time, they've been putting it off and putting it off. And then all of a sudden, oh, we've got company coming. Let me get those forks that I needed. But generally, generally, I found that it will still sell fairly consistently if you have a good inventory of it. It will sell year round. It's generally fairly inexpensive to find. At thrift stores, it's either in bags. I mean, my pet peeve is when a thrift store takes one pattern and splits it up among all the bags. But if you know it's a good pattern, then you just go ahead and go for it. Um, but generally, there's places where it's just in a bin that you have to dig and find all the matching pieces. And the return on investment is really hard to beat. So if you're only paying 20 cents, 25 cents, even if you're, you're ending up selling, you know, a fork or a spoon or whatever for $2, $3, $4, $5, some good brands go up to, you could sell one fork for $40, right? So... Yeah, there's just a lot of potential with flatware. It's very easy to store and it's very easy to ship. And I'll try to share some footage of shipping that as well. But I also would like, if there's any other questions, I've kind of told you some of the other videos that I was thinking of making, but if you have any more questions about selling stainless flatware, please feel free to leave that in the comment below and I'll try to get it into one of my next videos. Okay, so thank you so much, everybody. I am going to go edit this video real quick. And p please go ahead and hit the like button if any of this info was helpful. And go ahead and share it with other resellers if you think that's something that they might be interested in as well. So thanks so much, everybody. And we'll see you most likely Tuesday for um, the next What Sold. Okay, thanks, guys.